Today we want to discuss the progressive era as an economic, social, and political movement. Um, the progressive era itself is, is basically a change in attitude. If you think about it from this perspective, it's a change in attitude of the American people where they decided that someone else maybe should be helping them out. In a lot of cases, that was the government. We're going to talk about different legislation. Uh, we're going to talk about different amendments, things like that, that were, that were basically set up to try to create a very better environment for people. First thing we have to do is put this into a time frame. Uh, as you can see, 1901 to 1920 typically looked at as being the uh, uh, period of uh, progressive. The three progressive presidents were um, Teddy Roosevelt, who came to president in 1901 on the assassination of McKinley. Uh, you had Howard Taft, who was elected in 1908. And then you had the split election in 1912. You had the uh, election of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, all three of these are kind of looked at as being the progressive pre presidents. And if, again, if you could put that into a time frame there, that helps you uh, remember some of the things, help you be able to anchor that to uh, uh, some knowledge that you have. But the first thing we talk about are economic changes. The biggest problem that American society saw was the fact that there were a lot of these trusts, which were business combinations, uh, were beginning to monopolize different industries, uh, whether that be the oil industry, the railroad industry was another big one. Uh, but but the idea was that they want that your economics lesson for today is that um, capitalism or free market economy does not work well, um, does not work at all, as a matter of fact, without competition. You have to have competition to set the prices and demand and different things like that because uh, obviously it's supposed to be hands off from uh, the government and other uh, industry. So uh, the idea here is that that a lot of these trusts have now started to monopolize and take advantage of the consumers uh, by charging what they want because there is no competition in some situations. Uh, but Teddy Roosevelt is looked at as being in trust buster. That's why we have put his picture here. Uh, you also had Taft who passed a lot of antitrust legislation as well. But a couple of the major ones that they dealt with were the Sherman and the Clinton, Clayton Antitrust Act. Sherman Antitrust Act was actually passed in 1890, but it was the early 1900s because early 1900s before anyone was found guilty of it because of its wording. Uh, it's very ambiguously, very loosely worded. Uh, basically, it said that anyone found in uh, restraint of free trade. Well, you know, that's, that's leaves a lot of loopholes out there for people to get around it with. So, uh, but but uh, President Roosevelt, his presidency, did go after uh, made the choice to go after Standard Oil, which was one of the biggest companies companies at the time, uh, and they were actually found guilty of, of being in, in restraint of free trade. Uh, a lot of that was solved. A lot of those problems were solved with the Clayton Antitrust in 1914, uh, which basically uh, further clarified and gave a lot of substance to the uh, uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. It basically was much more specific as to what was not allowed um, and what, what could get you in trouble there. So moving on, we talk about the several different parts of the social movement that, that came about as far as progressive movement, the temperance movement being one of the uh, uh, more successful ones. Uh, this is a popular cartoon. You talk about the drunkard's progress, how you go from having a uh, single drink to drinking socially to, you know, now running in trouble with the law and having problems at home until eventually down at the end, you, you, know, you tend to make decisions that uh, basically uh, uh, aren't very good. Uh, so that this is one of the more popular cartoons I've seen on a few tests. Um, where where people uh, and and again the idea of the temperance movement was that uh, they could solve a lot of the ills of society by eliminating alcohol. Um, they could be more productive because people wouldn't be drinking, people wouldn't be hung over. They could be uh, less domestic violence because men aren't getting drunk and coming home uh, to their families. Different things like that. A lot of different issues like that they thought they could solve. It would eventually lead to uh, what we refer to as the. Uh, uh, the 18th Amendment, uh, which which is prohibition, basically it eliminated the uh, made it illegal the production or consumption of alcohol um, in the United States, um, and it's looked at it's looked at as uh, something that that was a noble idea. They call it the noble experiment. Uh, it basically was a situation where um, you know. It, 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 
really, really sounded good in theory, but it simply didn't work that well in practice. Uh, it would eventually be shot down in 1933 uh, by the 21st Amendment. Uh, again, the only way you can get rid of them in amendment is to uh, uh, be able to create another amendment which eliminates it. And they did that with the 21st Amendment, so that makes those two kind of uh, unusual in themselves. But, but again, this was in 1919 when that happened, uh, that the, the amendment was passed to uh, – make alcohol illegal in the United States. Um, you know, Jane Adams here on the left, uh, this is her whole house on the right. Uh, she was schooled in Europe, and while she was traveling there, um, started to see a lot of these settlement houses that, that were set up to try to help people who couldn't help themselves. Uh, a lot of it was immigration and different things like that. When she came back to Chicago, she decided to set one up. And uh, again, you know, the big thing to remember about it is that it had a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, Pre-K, uh, kindergarten programs for the little kids. Uh, they had after school programs where, you know, to get kids off the street, to try to get them better educated uh, after school programs. Uh, and they also had night classes where they taught uh, English, which was a huge and one of the biggest hurdles that a lot of immigrants, especially the new immigrants that were coming from Eastern Europe, um, that they were facing was the fact that they didn't speak English. And uh, this was one of the things that, that could help them uh, immensely there. So this was another one of the uh, looked at as being one of the movements to try to make things better. Uh, with with the rise of the trust, with the rise of industry, we started to see a lot of women and children going to work. You, know, you see a couple of kids here that probably aren't older than 10, 12 years old, uh, uh, working in very dangerous conditions. This is a bad situation. Obviously, 10, 12-year-old kids aren't going to make great decisions about different things that they do, but uh, they hired a lot of these women and children because they didn't have to pay them as much. They felt like they could control them more. Uh, and of course, children in particular were hired because they were very small, uh, nimble. They could get from machines very quick, and, and they also had very small arms and uh, fingers, so they could reach into the machines and maybe pull something out that might be jammed up there. And obviously, that's a bad situation because you get caught, uh, get a finger caught, get an arm taken off, a leg taken off. Uh, this was a pretty common occurrence uh, in these factories. So there were a lot of, uh, and again, the public started to look to the uh, government to set up laws to try to help this situation and, and uh, try to keep uh, especially the very young kids out of the factories. Uh, the next one is, is the women's suffrage, and we're kind of moving into the political part of it here. Uh, this was the women's right to vote. Uh, this has been going on out in the West, as you can see on the uh, left-hand flyer here. This has been going on out in the West in state election for a while where women have been allowed to vote. Uh, but this is a uh, uh, federally mandated now with, with the passage of the amendment. Um, in the middle, you see a, a copy, a picture of a book called The Perfect 36, which basically tells a story of uh, uh, women's suffrage and talks a lot about Tennessee. If you're taking the EOC, especially in the state of Tennessee, this is important to remember because Tennessee, in order to, in order to ratify an amendment, it takes three quarters of the states uh, to approve. And in this particular situation, Tennessee was a 36th state. It took 36 states. Tennessee was a 36th state. So with the passage uh in, in the state of Tennessee, then the uh, the uh, amendment actually became a uh, law at that point. So that's that's important to remember, especially if you're studying this in the state of Tennessee. Uh, it's uh, important to remember. Uh, continuing on the political standpoint, one of the big names is a guy by the name of Robert LaFollette. He was a Wisconsin governor who, uh, you know, Wisconsin was looked at as being kind of a uh, – a testing area. They did a lot of things in the state to try to think. So, but, but the idea was they wanted to make things more democratic. They wanted to put uh, more trust in the hands of the people. They wanted to get them. You, know, you see that with direct primaries, which is basically where the states got to choose their party candidates, which hadn't happened in the past. You also see it with the initiative referendum and recall. An initiative is where citizens are actually uh, placed ballot issues on the ballot without having a uh, um, a legislature, a legislator to uh, put those on there. Referendum is where they can vote to accept or reject measures that might have been uh, proposed by legislatures. And you also had recall, uh, recall vote, where voters could remove someone who was unsatisfactory uh, even before their term was up. So it, it basically gave a lot more power to the people. You saw that again with the 17th Amendment, uh, which uh, basically led to the uh, direct election of voting uh, of senators, which uh, 
and representatives had always done that before. Um, so that's, you know, those three are huge. Uh, the 17th, 18th, and 19th, the 17th being direct election of senators, the 18th being the uh, prohibition, and the 19th being women's suffrage. But uh, those are three major things to remember, especially if you're writing about this and going on. But uh, just remember that the progressive movement is a movement to try to make things better for society, to try to, to fix things. And, um, you know, the, 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 the characters that were involved, you know, a lot of these people um, are, are important to remember.